first and most important thing to say is that although my name is Murdoch, I have absolutely no uh, blood relation to Rupert. My uh, last, the last, it is, but it's the last letter of my name is a K, not an H, which uh, my side of the family take very seriously. First thing to say to you is you're not alone. Coffins like this are going to be carried into church halls and uh, other gatherings all over Portugal very soon. The Portuguese government has decided to sell their public television service to try to help pay off the colossal deficit which they're now facing. And even the BBC, which has been justly celebrated, finds itself now battling for its life, battling for its soul. Had it not been for two journalists for the Murdoch organization hacking into the cell phone of a dead teenager, Rupert Murdoch would have got total control of Sky Television, which he would have used relentlessly as a weapon to beat the BBC into the ground. The BBC still pays to have its channels on the Sky system. It should be the other way around. Murdoch should pay to carry them, but he doesn't. He's paid, virtually, he's paid virtually no tax at all since he's been operating. The, what you're talking about is grand larceny. They're stealing your heritage and they're stealing your rights. You have a right to watch television without being bombarded with advertising. Very simple rights. Your children have a right to watch television that does not have advertising, that does not sell incessantly merchandise and products related to films, related to cartoons, or related to movies. Your rights as a citizen are what is at stake here. A number of people have made this point. You have a right to comprehensive information about what is going on in the world. You have a right to comprehensive analysis of why things are the way they are. You have a right to a diversity of argumentation about what we should do about uh, situations. You have a right to see narrative stories, fantasies in all kinds of forms, not just soap operas, not just serials. Uh, and you have, this is very important, you have a right to participate. Nobody's mentioned this before. The future of public television will not simply be about what programs are made, although I'm as passionate as anyone in this room, but I'm married to a filmmaker. But it's about a new kind of social contract between public television and its audiences. One of the wonderful things about the rise of the internet is that it allows people to participate. So if we're going to fight for public television, we need to fight for it in a more comprehensive way. One of the most interesting things the BBC is doing at the moment is asking people to record everyday conversations. And they're going to be deposited in collaboration with the British Library. They'll be deposited in a national archive that will record the tone and the sound of life as it's lived at this moment in time. And this is a mass participation. It's what internet enthusiasts call crowdsourcing. It's an interactive situation. So the public television I would like to see is not just better programs, more diverse programs, but a more collective activity in which you and me, as members of the audience, have a chance to put something into a grand public resource. The other thing to say is that we must stop thinking about broadcasting as something that exists only by itself. You have museums, you have libraries, you have universities. We have a great resource of publicly funded institutions. One of the things that the new digital technologies allow us to do is to network those together. So that when you go to the public television service, my vision would be that it not only gives you a point of entry into a wonderful range of programs, but it's an alternative to Google. 
it's your point of entry into this massive range of new resources which are coming online from all over the world, from libraries, from museums, uh, from universities. My own university, for example, and universities around the world are now putting all of their research on the net for free. You don't know where it is, you don't know where to find it, but you could. We could create a public television service that was a point of entry into this great sea of public resources. You may very well lose the battle for Channel 7, but it should be the beginning of something better. It should be the beginning of a vision for a, a, a public resource that is open to everybody. And of course it should be funded. The thieves should pay back some of the money they've stolen. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And it's a peanuts for them. It's peanuts. But it would make all the difference. But not just to fund programs, but to fund a new kind of collective resource. You're right about the archive. It should be a public archive. But it should be accessible. All the museums should be accessible. All the galleries should be accessible. We have collectively a fantastic range of already material in the public domain. One of the great opportunities for public broadcasting is to be the gateway into that great domain. The place you would go to first to find out what, if you wanted to find out about science, yes? You watch a science program. Where else would you go to find out more? And the great thing that public television has is trust. People trust it. The, the thing that the BBC has, but none of the commercial television stations have, is that people trust it. They trust it to tell them the truth, they trust it not to con them, and they trust it not to do them down. That's a fantastic resource. And we can use that resource to open up a much wider range of opportunities for people. You're right, it's about choices. But it's not just about choices between programs. It's about a whole range of material that's already available to you, but needs to be organized, it needs to be made accessible. So when we think about what we're going to do about public television, don't just think about it as television. Think about it as something bigger than that. Think about it as part of a much wider group of resources. We already own them. The question is, what are we going to do with them? And how are we going to make them accessible? You already own the museum. You already own the library. Uh, this is a fantastic moment in technological history. We could do it, and we should do it. And if we don't do it, then the world will belong to Murdoch and it will belong to Google. I don't want to live in that world and I hope you don't.